Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you, St. Margaret. And with thy spirit. And let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. That we may perfectly love thee, worthily magnify thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This is the first Sunday in the month of August, and so we will go through the Decalogue together. God spake these words, and he said, I am the Lord thy God, I shall have no gods but me. I shall not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. I shall not bow down to them, nor worship them. I shall not take the, Lord, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother. I shall do no murder. I shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. I shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. I shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. I shall not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these thy laws. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Safe, we beseech thee to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Today's prayer is from the ninth Sunday in Trinity. Grant to us, Lord, we beseech thee, the Spirit to think and to do always such things as are right, 
that we who cannot do anything that is good without thee may by thee be enabled to live according to thy will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. lesson is written in the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua, beginning at the ninth verse. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. And on the morrow after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased on the morrow when they ate of the produce of the land. And the people of Israel had manna no more, but ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Here ends the lesson. Please join me in reading responsibly those portions of Psalm 34 as printed in the bulletin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let, Let me afflict to the ear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me. Look to him and be radiant, so your face, faces shall never be ashamed. This Lord may cry, and the Lord heard him, and he saved him on all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man who takes refuge in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle is written in the tenth chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians, beginning at the tenth verse. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same supernatural food, and all drank the same supernatural drink, for they drank from the supernatural rock which followed, which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things are warnings for us, not to desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to dance. We must not indulge in immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as a warning, but they were written down for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Here ends the lesson. Thank you, God.
chapter 15, starting in verse 2. Glory be to thee, O Lord. And Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto him his living, and not many days after, the young man gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked, What do these things mean? And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years have I served thee, neither have I transgressed at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gave me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which he who had devoured thy living with harlots, and you killed for him the fatted calf? And he said to him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, was lost, and is found. Praise be to thee, O Christ.
give me the words to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ to this parish this morning in the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So today we are talking about uh, one of the most famous parables in the Bible. A parable of the prodigal son. And it is found in a certain passage of parables. It's not, it's not just one parable, it's the third of three. And if you look at the passage, if you kind of take, if you were to open your Bibles and take a longer look at the scripture in Luke chapter 11, chapter 15, verse 11, you would see that the first 10 verses of Luke 15 include two other parables. The first parable in this passage, so it's like a three pack. You can't just take the, the parable of the prodigal. You've got to take all three together because they were told in sequence to make a bigger point. And so Jesus first tells the parable of the 99. And that's not a restaurant in New England. <laughs> the 99 is a parable about sheep. And so it is the parable of a shepherd who has lost one of his sheep. And so he's got 99 safely tucked away in the pen. But one of them got loose and is lost. And so the shepherd, before he goes to bed at night, he's counting off the sheep and he goes, you know, 97, 98, 99. There, where's the 100? He's not there. So instead of waiting till morning, the shepherd goes out into the storm at night and he will do everything he can to find that lost sheep. That's the first parable. Second parable is about a lady who loses some money, a lot of money. She loses some serious silver, and she is devastated because she needs this money. It's valuable. It is important to the welfare of her home. And so she gets up in the middle of the night, and she does everything. She even bothers her neighbor. Like, she's going to find this money. And when she finally finds the money, she rejoices. That's the second parable. The third is the parable of the prodigal son. So if you don't understand these, that they're a three-pack, it really doesn't have the same punch. Let me sort of bring this to you a little bit focused. These three parables have a thread that holds them together. And the thread is that Jesus goes looking for the lost. Whether it's a sheep that got lost in the middle of his shepherding moment, or if it's a, a housewife who's lost her mortgage payment for the month, or whether it's a son who's left his family and is lost to the world, Jesus is all about the lost. And you and I are lost. And so Jesus is all about us. The first parable, this demonstration is that there is nothing too far from God that it can't be rescued. There is no sheep, which we are identified as sheep in Scripture. There is no one who's gone, wandered too far from Christ that he cannot rescue you. There's no one too far that they can't be recovered. The second parable says that we are valuable. We are very valuable. And so there is nothing he won't do to recover it. The value that we represent in the kingdom of God as a person, as a soul, as a created entity, is so precious to God that he will not stop looking until he finds us. That's the second parable's meaning. And the third parable goes much deeper, and that's why it's so much longer. The third parable talks about two sons, really, not just one. We call it the prodigal some parable, but it's really about both the sons, right? It's about the son who goes off, and it's about the son who stays home. And both of them, at some level, are lost. So, as I read that parable, or as, as we went through the gospel, it's interesting to note <laughs> that the father was gracious to both of those sons, right? He had a generous heart and a gracious nature, the, the first son, he is gracious because he forgives him and welcomes him back. The second son, if you notice in the language, the second son is so miffed at the dad, he won't even go inside. 
So the father has to go outside to talk to his miffed off older son. Did you see that in the detail? Both sons were not what I would say healthy. Now, you may say, Father Brad, what, what right do you have to speak about parables of prodigal son? Because I am the poster child. <laughs> if you look it up in Wikipedia, you'll see me. It'll say, Father Brad. And you put in prodigal son. I was 33 years old before I responded to Christ. I was everything and more that's written about in this passage. And so, since this passage was written 2,000 years before I was a twinkle in Mimi's eye, I must assume it is a human condition. And you will find, you may say, well, I'm, I'm not a prodigal. I've never, I've just never strayed. I've never done those things. Well, first of all, I don't understand you. <laughs> Second of all, this parable is just as important to you as it is to me. Because what we'll find with just a little, I mean just five minutes of reflection. If you take five minutes during this sermon and think about this prayer, prodigal son story, you're going to identify with him either externally, like I do, or internally. Either way, we all are in this story. None of you gets out of this one. All of us, all of us will find ourselves in the story. So let's take a few obvious, I'm going to do a few obvious observations here. Number one, we should trust our Father all the time, right? Who's the Father in the story? It is God the Father. Definitely God the Father. And if you're a parent or grandparent and you've got children you probably could find yourself filling in the blank for this prodigal son or daughter, right? Right? Sorry, I'm from the South. Yeah, okay. Right. All of us could say that, right? We could all say, man, I have a son or daughter. I've got either in the relationship with you, they're estranged or they're gone or whatever they are, or spiritually, they may have a good, decent relationship with you, but they are estranged from their heavenly father, right? Their faith has grown cold, or they've rejected it, or they've done something to walk away from it, right? So if you find yourself as a parent or grandparent of a child who fits the prodigal story, then this, these four points are for you. So listen up. If you don't have that going on in your life, you can go back to sleep. All right. <laughs> Number one. We should trust our Father and let them go. Did you hear me? According to this parable, according to the dynamics of Scripture, not me, but me reading Scripture and applying it to life, we have to let them go. We've got to recognize we're not able to restrain them from what they think they want. And I also want to remind you this is not permanent. This is temporary. It's a season of maturation. It cannot be considered forever. God has a plan, and their story has not fully been written yet. We have to maintain perspective of eternity. We have to take the long view of God's wisdom and power to redeem them. Okay, that's number one. These are obvious things we observe. Second one, the rejection of our lifestyle and faith is not a personal rejection at least not entirely. It is a rejection of the obligations and restrictions the prodigal feels from the weight of our Christian faith. And they resent the expectations they believe God has for their life. Their freedom is their most cherished right. And they will make every effort to exert their freedom from restrictions or restraints, which usually means they will sever a relationship for a season. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Three, we don't give up on our prodigals. We look with expectation for the day when they will return to their faith and to us. 
The posture of faith is to position ourselves to see the first stirrings of repentance and restoration. We should expect them to return. Now, think about the posture of the father in the parable. It says that he saw him a long way off. And then he starts running for his son. Interesting. That means that he's been looking every day. You don't see someone a long way off if you're not looking for them. Which proves that he had faith. It proves that he knew in time his son would come home. And so he was ready. He was more than ready to receive him back. The fourth thing is the joy and satisfaction of a reconciled relationship with a prodigal cannot be full without our forgiveness and grace. The Spirit of God will pull the soul back to their created purpose and place in his kingdom. When we are not empowered to cause that repentance, and when it does occur, we should be prepared to extend full, complete grace and forgiveness. The restoration cannot be completed if we approach them with a critical spirit or a measured reaction that includes some type of comparison to other children. Did you catch that? Good. All right, we'll move on. Now, a few deeper thoughts. <clears throat> Who of us isn't lost? I mean, lost is a relative state, right? I already said that the obvious is the external. The physical, literal changes that can occur in a person's spirit about their faith, about their relationship with God, about their relationship with family. The immaturity, the selfishness, the narcissism, the impulsiveness of youth is explained in this parable. But then there's also the deeper, darker side of the older brother who does not understand grace, does not even comprehend it. And so he may be more lost than the dingbat prodigal. <laughs> because at least the prodigal, when he returns, understands that he needs grace. He understands that he has failed and says to his father, I don't even want to be considered your son. Just put me on as a hired helper. I don't deserve to be your son. Now that implies what? The root of wisdom. That in his failure and in his falling, he's really, truly glimpsed who he is and who he isn't. And in that, we see wisdom. And yet the older son, the one who's got his stuff together, does not understand grace. He does not understand forgiveness. And so he may be the most lost of all. Painful, this prodigal. Painful, this older son. Whichever category you fall into, and you have to fall in one or the other, you need to recognize that we all are in this parable. In fact, if you want to zoom out a little bit further, if you want to zoom way out in history, you can see that this parable is about the children of Israel. And they were the prodigal son. And Jesus is the one who came for them. Jesus is telling this parable to the Jewish leaders of his time. And he is explaining to them in ways that they don't fully understand. That whether you identify with this parable personally or as a group, it is still a parable that we need to be aware of. And then there's those of us who are good and faithful on the exterior, who think we've sort of been good to earn our way into God's good graces. And then Henry Nowen, a great theologian, wrote this. What's lost in our story? For a very long time, I considered low self-esteem to be some kind of virtue. But now I realize that the real sin is to deny God's love for me. 
to ignore my original goodness because without claiming that first love and that original goodness for myself, I lose touch with my true self and embark on a destructive search among the wrong people and in the wrong places for what can only be found in the house of my father. There are many other voices that are constantly calling me back into my old traps. And before I'm even fully aware of it, I find myself wondering why someone hurt me, or why they rejected me, or why they didn't pay attention to me. Without realizing that, I find myself brooding about someone else's success, my own loneliness, and the way the world abuses me. And despite my conscious intentions, I often catch myself daydreaming about being rich or powerful or famous. And all these mental games reveal to me the fragility of my faith, that I am the beloved one on whom God's favor rests. I am so afraid of being disliked, blamed, put aside, passed over, ignored, persecuted, and killed that I am constantly developing strategies to defend myself and thereby assure myself of the love I think I need and deserve. And in doing so, I move further away from my father's home and choose to dwell in a distant country. Many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than to God. A little criticism makes me angry. A little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits. And a little success excites me. It takes me very little to raise me up or thrust me down. Often I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. And I forget that these are the obvious signs that I have left my home as a prodigal. <clears throat> Interesting. I have to let go of all comparison, all rivalry and competition. As a receiver of grace, I am in a position to have gratitude. But if I don't perceive that I need grace, I will live in a place of comparison. Grace gives me gratitude. It wasn't that good. Grace gives me gratitude. And when I don't see that I need grace, I never extend grace, and I just have a critical, comparative spirit. Which are you going to be? Eighty-two percent of my generation left the church because the church chose no grace. We will criticize and compare because we're insecure about our own faith. We will not be like that here. This will be a church of grace. And because of that, we will extend grace and we will live with a spirit of gratitude. No other message can convey the Father's heart. If we're going to change the world, we've got to start with our own. And I am grateful that this is a church of grace. I'm not preaching to you to, to exhort you like you aren't gracious. I'm preaching to you to remind you how important it is. Because once we leave these doors, the critical, comparative world will tear us apart. And so it is grace, our received grace and our extended grace to others. Wow, allows us to live with a gracious attitude. <laughs> Grateful for what we have. Content 
and gracious to others. And that is what this world is desperate for. Because very few, very few live like that. So, let's close in prayer. Father, we need to be gracious. Recognizing you forgave us. Recognizing we don't deserve any of it. And so help us, Father, to maintain that posture of gratitude. Help us to trust you for the prodigals in our life. Help us to trust you for the prodigals in our own heart. Those things in our life that keep wanting to leave you. Help us to live in that state of grace. And help us to live in that state of hope and expectation, looking forward eagerly to the day when we will be reconciled. We are grateful for this parable and for the truth of the Word of God and how it changes us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive.
let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayer and supplication, and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and our oblations, and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth and unity and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, live in unity and godly love. And we beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. And give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here at St. Margaret's, that with meek hearts and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. I think of my friend Charlotte, who's at Maine Med in Portland. Thank you for helping her through that surgery on Friday. I pray your blessing over her and her daughter Jane Marie in the recovery. I pray that you'll encourage her heart, strengthen her body. I pray for Matthew, for his sobriety and emotional healing. For Clint, who's not a believer but has a heart condition. Pray that you'll save him spiritually and physically. I pray for Emma, whose cranial surgery is tomorrow. Keep her safe, Father. I think of Beatrice. We're grateful for her good health. I ask that it will continue. I pray for Barbara, for her eyesight, for Alicia, for Harmony and her family and home. We pray for Carrie and Peter, upcoming move. For Dale and his family, for their comfort after the loss of his wife. I pray for Beth. Thank you for her continued healing. And we ask for Chris, Lorraine, and family that you would strengthen them through illness and make your presence known in their life and family. And Father, I think of our nation. I think of this continuing COVID situation. I pray for your reason and your peace to rule over fear and frustration. I pray for health and wholeness in our country, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally and spiritually, that you would bring unity to the different parts of our nation, and that the voices of separation, the voices of rage and frustration would be silenced and instead, there would be a new spirit of cooperation and love and respect and grace towards each other. We know that will require your Holy Spirit. And so may your Christians, those who call upon your name in all parts of our nation, cloak themselves with humility and grace. And may we extend it supernaturally to those we don't agree with, to the honor of your Son, Jesus. And we also bless your holy name for all thy servants who have departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom, Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. You who do truly 
and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith. And take this holy sacrament to your comforts. And make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. <coughs> Almighty God, Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ maker, maker of all things and judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our natural sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought and worry and deed against our divine Provoking most us in our wrath and indignation against us, we are us in repent, and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For the Son of our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all of the past. Grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give what comfortable words our Savior Christ says unto those who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all who believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here also what St. Paul says, this is a true saying and it's worthy of all men to be received. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here also what St. John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. And lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. And therefore, with angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising thee and saying.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for Thou, Thy tender mercy, did give Thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by His one oblation of Himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute it in His holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that His precious death and sacrifice until His coming again. For in the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it, and remember it for me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer to thee the memorial thy Son has commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseech me to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us but we in him, and although we are unworthy through our manifold sin to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee. O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. 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 And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say.
of the Lord be with you always. And, with thy spirit. and we do not presume to come to this thy table of merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed with his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. takes away the sin of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come to my room, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. With the uh, rising COVID rates, I'm going to wear my mask. No one else has to, but I just don't want anyone to panic when you come up. Observe and 
keep your body and soul there. Mm -hmm.
us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we most highly thank thee for that thou dost God save to feed us, who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us and that we are very members of the corporate and the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs to the hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of his most precious death and passion. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And so, Father, I come with a personal request for the prodigals in our family to come home. I pray that over this parish and every family in this room those that are estranged from their children and grandchildren may they be drawn home to Jesus may they inexplicably be drawn to the truth and may the light of hope break through the darkness and may the truth of the word of God break through the lies of the enemy Lucifer we speak these words in faith, we believe them, and we trust you with the fulfillment of them through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. benediction is for those of prodigals. Hear me well. The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessings of God Almighty Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you. Always. Heck yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>